Welcome, brothers and sisters, to another episode of Truth Matters, where we seek to equip our followers with the tools to discern the truth in an age filled with strategic misinformation and manipulation. Today, Mackenzie and I would like to welcome a very special guest, Barbara O'Neill. Barbara, who was originally trained as a nutritionist, has spent over 40 years speaking around the world, advocating a health message that focuses on the body's own ability to heal itself. She identifies and teaches that a healthy and properly operating immune system can prevent many of today's most costly and life-threatening illnesses. And she does this often in the face of the most fierce opposition. Welcome, Barbara, and thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. I know our audience is very excited to hear from you. You're welcome. So we've got a lot to talk about today. We do. So much, in fact, that you're going to be joining us for two episodes. And we're really grateful for that because the nature of why there's so much to talk about stems from the fact that many today are struggling to differentiate between good and bad information. And it's not really a, a lack of information that today's society struggles with, but really a lack of discernment to tell what is good information and what isn't. In fact, Barbara, isn't this one of the key topics you're covering in your newest series? What is truth and how can we determine what that is? That's right. That's right. What you say is absolutely right. So it, what are some of the ways that we can find out what information is good information what information is bad information because many people will say oh well there's this diet and that diet and the other diet and they have studies for all of them so how can we really weed through and find out what is the actual what is truth it's a very good question and i believe that there is a way i believe that god never meant us to to uh, be wandering around in the dark, so to speak, regarding health. I like, to the, I like to use the BHSC method. That's Bible, history, science, and common sense. And I believe that, the, that God is the author of all of those. And God, God laid out very clearly in the Garden of Eden the best diet for, for man. We also have history where we can see the healthiest uh, groups of people on the planet and have a look at what what they eat. We will sign. We will find that the science certainly um, supports that. And we've also got common sense, which unfortunately isn't very common today. So I like to use that method in in every subject, and it has it has never failed me. And then the final thing is. In Australia, we say, if you're on a good thing, stick to it. And the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5.21, prove all things and hold fast to that which is good. There are basic principles that we can all implement. I think the fine tuning is uh, up to each one of us. A 300 pound person may have a slightly different diet to me, who's a mere 100 pound person. But of course, again, that, that's common sense. Right. And I think that's a that's a good thing to keep in mind. I think people don't know how to read their bodies properly because they might pick things that feel good at the time or taste good at the time, but not in a long lasting way. How can we learn to listen to what our bodies are telling us better? That's that's a very good question. Um, we've been my husband and I have been running health retreats for over 20 years and I take to heart a saying that um, came from a book called The Ministry of Healing where the writer said the only hope of better things is the education of people in the right principles and there's a proverb, it's Proverbs 14.6, it says knowledge is easy to him that understands. When I teach I like to give people an understanding of what certain foods are doing in their bodies. I also like to show them the nutrients that the body needs. Now, taste is important, but unfortunately, many food today tastes good, but it's killing us. Or on the other hand, it doesn't taste very good, but it's got all the nutrients necessary for a strong body. We, we need to, to marry or merge good taste and good nutrition. 
And what role does uh, health and discernment play? Are those two things correlated? Meaning when we give our, our bodies the, the proper fuel to operate, are we better able to follow that message that you found laid out in, in the scriptures as a proper, not just diet, but in, in total, being able to be in more alignment with God's will when we, when we follow this message that you preach? You're absolutely right, Matt. And when we run one-week programs at our retreats, we speak all week about um, the conditions that the body requires to heal. And then on the last day, we go to the mind. And I show how malnutrition, dehydration, they all affect our mind. And there are quite a few books written on this subject. It is a subject which is of the greatest interest to me because I worked as a psychiatric nurse for four years and I didn't see people get better. And we ate badly, the, the patients ate badly, but I see people get better now. And I think that's exciting. You, the same blood that goes through the body goes through the mind and absolutely our food affects our mind. So then um, <clears throat> you mentioned the Bible. So what sort of a diet do we see in the Bible? Because I know some people say, oh, we should be uh, fruititarians because that's what it is in, in the Garden of Eden. They were eating fruit and only vegetables and er everything else was added later. Well, I, I like to use the Bible as my guide because I believe it is the Word of God. And I don't think you can improve on the Garden of Eden diet. And in Genesis 1.29, God said to Adam and Eve, Behold, I've given you every herb-bearing seed which is upon the face of the earth, and every tree, and the which of the tree is a fruit-bearing seed. To you it shall be for meat. So we look at meat as the main substance of their diet. So what's a seed? All your grains are seeds. What's Another seed is a legume. So there's your chickpeas, lima beans, black-eyed beans, cannelloni beans, and the seed. So you've got uh, sunflower seed, pumpkin seed, sesame seed, flax or linseed, chia seed. And the fruit-bearing seed is the nut. Now, I look at that diet and then we look at it nutritionally, scientifically. It's nutrition that I, that I studied at a Bachelor of Science level, and we went right into detail what makes up every food and how does that compare with the body's needs. The three essential food groups that we're looking at nutrition and science now are fiber, and all of those foods are high fiber. The other essential nutrient is protein. 50% of the membrane around every cell is protein. Protein is the building blocks of the body. So my son James, who inherited my body type, which is hard to put on weight, no fun for a boy who wants to be big and muscly, he certainly worked out a lot, but he had to supplement with protein. Every bodybuilder knows they've got to have the protein to build. And I was intrigued by this. So when I studied it nutritionally and discovered that the body cannot heal without protein, the body cannot build without protein, protein is an essential nutrient. Nice to know that vegetarian protein is very clean burning fuel compared to animal protein, which of course was not in the Garden of Eden because there was no death. It's not very clean burning fuel. And the third essential nutrient is fat. And there's been huge amounts of misconceptions on fat. And the nuts and the seeds particularly are excellent sources of fat, the fats that our body needs to run. 50% of the membrane around every cell in the body is fat. So you see, if someone goes on a fruit diet, the two essential ingredients that they are missing out on, mind, mind you, they have a lot of fiber, that's only one of the essential ingredients. The other two essential ingredients are protein and fats. And so, I guess it's difficult for, for a lot of people and maybe for many of our, our viewers and our listeners to understand how to create that, that balance because it sounds like what you're describing is there is a, a, a vegan lifestyle that may be a healthy lifestyle and a vegan lifestyle that may be an unhealthy lifestyle. Is there, is there a setup where we could consider veganism actually to be dangerous if not done under the right conditions? 
It certainly, it certainly can be, and I've met some very sick vegans. I've had several guests say to me, I became a vegan, but I got so sick I had to go back on meat, and I know exactly what's happened. When God said, behold, I've given you every herb bearing seed, I believe that he meant there to be a balance of the seed, some whole grains, some legumes, some seeds. And I find a lot of vegetarians, I've met several young men that stopped the meat and ate pasta and bread and cereal. So they actually were overloading the grain part and sadly neglecting the legume part. And then in the back of everyone's mind is this fat phobia that was first presented by Ansel Keys. Here's a bit of history in 1953 that fat causes heart disease. And as Malcolm, Dr. Malcolm Kendrick states in his book, The Great Cholesterol Con, this, this theory has never been proven. And then I have people say to me, yes, but Barbara, we, we heard that when you eat fat, all your blood cells clump together. Well, for... I'd say 10 years I did the live blood analysis at our retreat and I've looked at hundreds of bloods under the microscope and the only time I saw blood cells clump together is when the person is dehydrated. So I say these things because there are a lot of misconceptions out there and that's what I like to do. I like to try and dispel the misconceptions and use the Bible, history, science and common sense to present what is truth so there's no more confusion. So uh, we mentioned, just kind of jumped in there, uh, a vegan diet. So if people don't know already, uh, Barbara promotes a plant-based diet. So could you explain to us kind of why and what the difference is between plant-based versus vegan? Because there is a little bit of difference there actually. There's definitely a difference between vegetarianism and veganism. Uh, the, the vegetarian usually does eat some dairy. I have been in places where pe people have said, you're vegetarian, is that right? I say, yes. And they say, so you eat chicken and fish, is that right? But <laughs> no, I say, I eat vegetables. <laughs> So you see, there's quite a, mis a lot of misconceptions. Some people think vegetarian is, you can eat the white meats. Some people think vegetarian, and usually vegetarian is some dairy products, whereas vegan is purely plant-based. And a lot of people say, well, what do you eat? Well, we make some beautiful dishes and we make creams and cheeses and butters out of blended nuts. A blender's a good, a good thing to have with flavorings, but mostly what we eat is lots of vegetables, some raw, some cooked, and always legumes and some whole grains, so some nuts and seeds, so it's a balance. And when you think about it, there's so many different vegetables, there's so many different legumes, there's so many different nuts, there's so many different seeds, and you can certainly get a balance. It's it's knowing what to do with it. So one of the first cookbooks that I had was a, was a vegan Indian cookbook. And Indians know how to prepare their legumes. And I've got some good news. No, it's not all hot curries. <laughs> Beautiful flavors. So it's, it's knowing what to do with them, knowing how to prepare them. And there's a book called Nourishing Traditions by Sally Fallon. And this author looks traditionally at how food was prepared. And she shows how legumes were always soaked. They were always well rinsed. They always had a nice slow cook, usually on the corner of the fuel stove, but they were always made taste beautiful. And by the way, this not only makes them taste beautiful, but it also adds to the digestion of the legumes by adding some whole salt, so by adding maybe onions, garlic, ginger, herbs, uh, a good quality oil. I always put my oil in right at the end so the heat doesn't destroy it. So it really is gaining a knowledge on how to prepare these foods. And it seems like with this health message, there is a more than just um, a physical component. And I think a lot of people struggle with 
the consistency when they look to make lifestyle changes. And so those who are looking to make that next step into, let's say those who have gone from a meat-based diet to a vegetarian and now want to cross over into that, that next level, um, what role does their spirituality, their faith uh, play in being able to stay committed to that, that plan, that it's not just a, a physical outcome that we're looking for, but that it's actually a whole wellness that, that goes along with this message. Can you talk a little bit more about the non-physical component of it? Yes, I, I certainly can. There's an interesting verse that explains it a little bit, and it's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, where the Bible says, No, you're not, that ye are the temple of God, and the Spirit of God dwells in you. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Now, this takes us to a whole other level where the Bible says that our body is actually the temple of God and we really need to look after it. And there's another verse that says, says no, you, not that you're not your own. And so when you love God and you want to please God, you want to live according to his ways, I think that you will take a little bit better care of your body because as the Bible says, you're, you're not even your own. And then it says, for you were bought with a price. This is in uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 18 and 19. That this puts a whole, an, a whole other new light on it. We have no right to hurt this body. And by the way, when we do hurt it, we are the ones that suffer. It's not nice living in a body that doesn't work. And unfortunately, so many people who are my age in their late 60s live in bodies that do not work. And it's, it's not genetics, <laughs> it's actually what you're doing to your body. And I believe that the older I get, the more powerful this message will get. Because when people are young, when they're in their 20s, their 30s, they, they're basically living on their youth. They're in a body that still has a lot of vitality. And a lot of people blame their problems on age. And I think poor old age, it gets blamed for so many things. God never designed the body to deteriorate. He designed that the body to remain strong. Obviously, the aging is going to come. I, I do have more wrinkles now than I had when I was 40 or 20. But people are getting old too young, far too young. And so that's one of the beauties of this message is you, you're going to be living in a body that will do you well, but it will also clear your mind. And when our mind is clear, it's a lot easier to discern spiritual things. I think the, the mind, like you were mentioning earlier, is very affected by our, the things that we eat. And also the mind can have an effect on how our body is as well. I think in the same book you're referencing, Ministry of Healing, there is a chapter called Mind Cure. Can you talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. In fact, there's one statement in there that I think is very pertinent for this. She says, grief, anxiety, discontent, remorse, guilt, distrust, all break down the life forces and can invite decay and death into the body. Now that's strong statements. But it is backed up by modern day science. Dr. Carolyn Leaf, in her book, she says that when we entertain or cherish negativity, thorns grow between the dendrites creating illnesses, even psychosomatic illnesses. It, the current figures are 50% of people today uh, have or will or are suffering from some form of mental illness. I, I don't think there's ever been a time on the planet when it has been to such, such a level. And God never meant the mind to deteriorate the way it is. Yes, the body will develop gray hair and wrinkles, but the mind should not deteriorate. And this is another misconception. I have not read in the Bible of Alzheimer's or dementia, and yet some of the Bible characters lived to lower 800 years age and their mind was still clear. So this is another huge misconception. The current figures in Australia are... Uh, 1,700 cases of Alzheimer's is being diagnosed every week. Now, God, God never meant for that to happen. 
And it's often not one thing. A lot of little threads come together to make a strong rope and it's all of those little threads and in some people it can be different threads and this is why I advocate that we are all our own doctors. For some people the anxiety, the, the discontent, the remorse, guilt, distrust is because of lack of sleep. For some it's because of poor nutrition. For some it's too many stimulants. For some it is damage to the to the nerve cells because they are a boxer or they are a footballer. You see this, this huge area that it possibly could be. And Dr. Bruce Fife in his book, Stop Alzheimer's Now, he spends the first three chapters looking at all the different things that can cause damage to the brain. I'd like to take a moment to try to give our listeners some tangible materials that they can start to use to absorb some of this information. I think we've talked about Ministry of Healing so far, uh, but we also have in, internally talked about a, a book called Back to Eden by Jethro Kloss. And it's, I believe it's a text that we'd, we'd recommend to people to look at. Barbara, can you share a little bit? I think uh, mckinsey has got a copy of it there. I've got it right and, here. Uh, why don't you give us a little background on that and, and allow people to understand what the benefit of seeing some of these texts in, in, in understanding the message and really internalizing what the what the purpose is? Because what we're talking about isn't just, a, as we've said, isn't just a physical health and wellness message, but is an all-around message to really get back to our original state the best that we can to be able to receive and understand and discern that which is good and that which is not um, so what, what does books like Garden of Eden, Ministry of Healing, and maybe other ones you might recommend do for uh, people who don't already know this message? Okay, well, the Ministry of Healing was one of my first books, and I, I love the way the author links in the physical and the spiritual, the emotional and the mental there, and the chapter uh, Mind Cure, which um, Mackenzie just quoted, excellent excellent chapter. And the book um, Back to Eden, it was my first herb book. In fact, it's called The Bible on Herbs. In Psalm 104 verse 14, the Bible says that God gave herbs for the service of man. I love this verse because the word service explains it beautifully. The herbs come in to serve you. Every herb affects different parts of the body. And there is a herb for all different aspects of the body, different functions of the body. And Jethro Kloss does a, a wonderful work of um, explaining that and defining what each herb is, what it does. For instance, I remember my, my first two little children when they were about four and five, I think, whooping cough went around and all the children were coughing. And I opened Jethro Kloss's book and I looked at all the herbs for the chest and there one of the herbs was growing in our backyard. It was plantain. Another name for that is ribwort. And so I gathered a lot of it. I poured the boiling water on it. I put a bit of lemon and honey and I got the children to drink it. I got fancy straws. I got little tea sets. <laughs> I just wanted them to drink, drink, drink. And within two weeks, they'd totally recovered and all the other children were coughing. And the other mother said, what did you do? But when I told them, they, they were very sad because their children only drink juice or cordial. You see, my children only drank water, so this little tea was exciting. It had a bit of lemon and honey in it. So that was probably one of my first experiences. And I also thought to myself, I don't mind if they wet the bed because I want this terrible cold healed. They didn't wet the bed. So I went back to the book and looked at it again, and it's also a kidney herb. <laughs> so that was my first experience of, um, of herbs, of finding um, how the herbs can certainly help. Medicine calls it synergism. They work with the needs of the body. They come in and they say to the body, where would you like me? How can I help you? You see, the body has an inbuilt ability to heal itself, and the beauty of the herbs is they work with that inbuilt body's ability to heal itself. And if someone takes the wrong herb, 
then they're not going to be hurt because the, the herbs don't harm you. In fact, if someone died from a herb, that would make headlines, wouldn't it? <laughs> but there are, ma there are many that die from drug medication, I'm afraid, but, but not from the herbs. And so I think that um, Jethro Kloss's Back to Eden is a, is a great book for, for every home to have. He, he's done a great reference in the back. If, you know, as w what I did, my, my children had a bad cough, so I looked up coughs. I looked the herbs for the coughs, and there were probably about 20, and I was able to bring it down to what was available to me. So, yeah, this is an absolutely amazing book. This is one of the books that I also had read. And uh, like she said, it's a great resource. You can actually get it from Amazing Discoveries. Um, I would recommend that everybody gets one of these books. It's very good on herbs, but it has a lot of other things inside here as well as uh, different natural remedies that you can do. It talks about even different diets and how to structure your meals. And it talks about all those things that uh, Barbara was referencing, referencing earlier. It's a great resource. And actually, this is quite an old book. So... Barbara, that's a little bit surprising because uh, we think of the sort of the plant-based or vegan movement as kind of a new thing that's out there. But this is quite an old book already, as well as Ministry of Healing. Yes, it's a, it is a very old book. I think it was written in the mid-1800s, as was Ministry of Healing. And Jethro Kloss's story was interesting. Apparently he was quite ill and he read the Ministry of Healing, implemented the principles and recovered. And from that, he became very interested in natural remedies and Back to Eden came out of, of that book. So you are right, the vegetarian vegan diet is not a new one. It has been around for a, for a long, long time. And so have the herbs that God has recommended that we use. So it's amazing how, you know, technology is shifting and we think that we're getting more sophisticated in what we actually are coming to learn that going back to uh, original um, ways of living are actually more sustainable and more healthy for the body and the mind. Now, you talk a lot about the use of herbs and spices in, in natural remedies. Uh, one of those that sits right in the crosshairs is cayenne pepper. And uh, you'll get a wide spectrum, a wide variety of opinions on how and why and when cayenne should be used. But uh, Barbara, you've talked a lot about this. Could you share a little bit about cayenne and its benefits and also maybe where some people are, are misusing it or overusing it? I believe you, you have a story of a gentleman who maybe stuck his whole hand in a jar of cayenne and maybe that's not the, the, the recommended, recommended dosage for those kinds of things. But um, the cayenne is one of those those uh, those herbs that that really can have a lot of benefits for people if they understand and use it uh, correctly. And I know you talk about that in some of your lectures. So while you can only talk about it briefly, maybe point people to a place where they can find a little bit more about that as well. You're absolutely right. Um, a lot of people get confused about uh, cayenne because it's a stimulant. And a lot of people are wanting to get away from the stimulants. Well, we need to define what sort of a stimulant is it. Now, caffeine, alcohol, many drugs, tobacco with its nicotine, they are nervous system stimulants. And they are not good because they certainly are addictive and not only addictive, but damaging to the nervous system on the body. But this is not caine. Caine is a blood stimulant. Anything that moves blood is incredibly beneficial to the body. As Leviticus 17.11 states, the life of the flesh is in the blood. So you move blood to an area, you're moving life to the area. You see, the blood contains the nutrients, it contains the oxygen, it contains the water, it carries the white blood cells. In fact, in blood is everything that our body needs to heal. Now, I wanted to define that. First of all, that Cain is a blood stimulant. And by the way, Jethro Kloss thought so highly of the cayenne pepper that instead of devoting half a page to it, like he does to every other herb, he devotes 10 pages to it. So 
What cayenne pepper is, it's a blood stimulant. It can be used internally and it can be used externally. And the story that I told you yesterday about the man who had his hand crushed and they're about to, they're talking about taking the tip of one of his fingers off. And I said, cayenne pepper, if you wrap cayenne pepper around it, it will stimulate blood into the area. If you can get blood into that tip, you'll get life into that tip and he will not need to lose. He showed me a picture and he had put about a teaspoon of cayenne pepper on that fingertip. He'd wrapped it up and he was just gritting his teeth. He was in so much pain. So I quickly wrote back and said, please take it off immediately. That, that is just too, too much. He said, my whole hand is hurting. My, my whole arm is hurting. I said, no, 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 no. Now, he, that cane will not hurt that finger, but you've heard the old saying, treatment was successful, but the patient died. We, we need to keep the person alive and functioning and comfortable. So I, so I, I wrote back and I said, please, now, he didn't, he didn't want to look at cane pepper again, and I understand that. He just wrapped his hand up for the night because he couldn't get all the cane pepper off. I said, we've got a saying in Australian, let sleeping do dogs lie. It had settled right down. I said, just leave it for 24 hours. And I said, and when you open it again, put the soothing aloe on, the aloe vera, the soothing aloe vera. And I said, put a faint sprinkle of cayenne pepper on it. Faint. <laughs> so, um, you know, again, it wouldn't have hurt him, but he could not, he could not handle the pain. It was just too, too much. I said to him, it is easier to put a little more on than a little less. I've even seen a lady come out of a heart attack by giving her cayenne pepper by mouth. We put about half a teaspoon in her mouth. She, she was half conscious. Her her pulse was faint. It was in the middle of a cooking class, so we had people everywhere. We quickly put the cane pepper in her mouth. I gave her some water. Within two minutes, the man holding her pulse said the pulse is strong. She opened her eyes. All the blood came into her face. She'd been very pale. She wondered what had happened. Her husband couldn't believe it. This was the fourth minor heart attack that she'd had that year. She was in her 80s. He, he was astonished. What did the cane do? The cane thinned the blood. The cane pepper opened. It just opens those capillaries to get a better and more powerful flow of blood through the body. But taken regularly, yes, it will thin the blood. Yes, it will open those capillaries. But it will also strengthen the arterial wall. So it is an excellent herb for the heart and for the blood. Which is why I think that Jethro Kloss put 10 pages on cayenne and not just, you know, a little section like he does for a lot of the other, the other herbs. And one misconception I think people have about cayenne pepper or other hot peppers is the actual healing property in it is called capsaicin. And that's what, where the word capsicum fr comes from. And that is what makes it taste hot. It's not actually hot. It just gives a sensation of heat in the body or in the mouth. And capsaicin is in all hot peppers, not just cayenne. Cayenne was the most readily available at the time, which is why it was the, the main one wrote about. Uh, or you can buy in the store very easily. You can just go and you can buy cayenne pepper. But if you're growing different peppers in your garden, they all can work the same. Maybe not quite as well as something hotter like a cayenne pepper, but they can have a similar and helping effect because it's the capsaicin in the pepper that is actually creating that. Yes, I like to call it a tingle rather than a burn because it, as, as one doctor says in Jethro Kloss's book, he says it's impossible to abuse it and it's impossible to cause a lesion. It will never cause a lesion. And of course, a burn will call a lesion, cause a lesion. You know, that takes me into thinking of like, what are the other common misconceptions that are out there? And, and one of the things that pops up in my mind right away is, is the controversy around the use of soy. 
uh, talk about a, 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 a food that is, is really misunderstood and actually almost has had some kind of campaign against it, it seems like. I don't know. I'm not going to say where or from who, but it seems like there's been an active campaign maybe for the last 15, 20 years almost against the use of soy. So maybe we can take the opportunity to, to set the record straight on some of the misconceptions regarding something that I think we all agree if used properly and in, in the right type can be something really beneficial. It absolutely is. In fact, soy has more anti-cancer properties in it than any other food. So it's a pity to throw the soybean out. I say it's like throwing the the baby out with the bathwater. <laughs> but soy has been tampered with. And in America today, the soybean that's grown is called Roundup Ready. It's been genetically modified, so there's problem number one. Anything that's been genetically modified has the ability to tamper with our DNA. So genetically modified food shouldn't be touched. So it's been genetically modified and one farmer told me this. He said to me, five times before harvest, the field is sprayed with Roundup or glyphosate, a very dangerous poison. So the soybean grown in America today has been genetically modified and it has five doses of Roundup. The farmer said to me, all the weeds die and the soybean creeps growing. That is a dangerous soybean. So when someone says, is soy bad? I say, which soy are you talking about? We should be eating the whole soil, not a soy isolate, and we should be eating non-GMO, organically grown soy. Then, then it is not a problem. A friend of mine did a thesis on soy, and people ask her all the time. She said, I answer with one, with one sentence. She said, God made it good, man mucked it up. So <laughs> that's what you've got to remember. Now, a lot of people get confused because they say, isn't it high in phytic acid? And doesn't phytic acid in, inhibit the uptake of minerals in the body? Well, wheat, whole wheat, is t has 10 times the phytic acid in it, and you do not hear of that. And there's research coming out today showing that phytic acid can even have anti-cancer properties. So it's all got to be taken in consideration. I also have people say to me, but it's high in anti-nutrients. I said, yes, that's if you eat a bucket full of soy a day. We're not eating bucketfuls of soy a day. And the same anti-nutrients that are in it, God put there to help resist bugs as it's growing in the soil. So again, all have it, but it is not a problem unless, of course, you're eating truckloads of it and it's impossible to eat truckloads of it. Another claim is that it has estrogen in it. And if someone has breast cancer or prostate cancer, they should not be eating soy. So and then let's have a look at the estrogen. The estrogen that is found in chemicals, that is found in Roundup, that is found in plastics, is 400 times stronger than the estrogen that the body naturally makes. It's actually 20,000 times stronger, sorry, a, a correction there. So this, the, the estrogen that's found in chemicals, in waste, in plastics, it's 20,000 times stronger than human estrogen. Human estrogen is 20,000 times stronger than plant estrogen. So soy is the plant estrogen. So it is the chemical estrogens that are 400,000 times stronger than the plant estrogens. So just that one piece of information alone, that's a bit of science for you, that shows you very clearly we don't need to, we don't need to feed the soy estrogens, it is the, the chemical estrogens. And the soybean grown in America today is full of those chemical estrogens from the things like Roundup or glyphosate. But let me tell you something about the natural estrogen. So when the nat natural estrogen, which is quite a mild estrogen, when it comes to your cell, it knocks on the door and says, excuse me, cell, do you need me? And cell says, no, we've already got too much estrogen. And so the plant estrogen sits in the receptor site, just waiting in case it's needed.
But because it's sitting in the receptor site, the chemical estrogens can't get into that cell because the plant estrogen is protecting it. So can you see that the soy estrogens play a protective role? They protect against the harmful estrogens. They work with the needs of the body and if they're not needed, they'll just sit at the door. A, a very welcome house guest that will only come in under invitation. So you can see by what I've just told you, the truth on soy. I'm not interested in, and, and I don't think anyone should be interested in what I think. It's what is. So that's why I like to, I like to give the reasons. And what I think is actually based on those reasons. Whereas unfortunately, many people just believe what the media says. And I don't want to shock you, but not everything that is said on the television is actually absolutely right, because unfortunately, often vested interests are behind it. But I thank God that he's given each one of us the ability to weigh up the pros and cons and determine for ourselves what is truth it is our god-given right and i think that is a really good point about the soy that you made the phytoestrogen is actually protective of the cell from those other estrogens which can cause estrogen dominance because they're just charging into that cell and estrogen dominance is actually a very big thing in the world right now and for men who are worried about being too estrogenetic, that actually protects you from having too much estrogen in the cell because it's blocking those receptors. So for women, it's going to help them from becoming estrogen dominant and balancing that. And for men, it'll help you from having too much estrogen. So it works both directions, just perfectly how it was made naturally, as long as it's not a GMO version of that soybean. That's, a, that's absolutely true. And what you say is right, Mackenzie, the estrogen dominance is causing all sorts of problems today. Estrogen is not bad. It's only when it's in high amounts and the plastics, the chemicals there, and the, um, and the genetically modified soybean, they're adding to that estrogen dominance. So with men, yes, it's not only that they can be effeminate, but it can even affect the, their sperm. It can even affect oh, many, many things that are happening sexually with men. But with women, high estrogen opposes thyroid function, so women can get thyroid problems. High estrogen can be the cause of fibroids and cysts developing in the uterus and on the ovaries. And you know, we have so many couples today that are having trouble having babies, having trouble conceiving. And what we're talking about is, is part of the problem. And one thing to note is there's a lot of things said about soy. Let's take the phytoestrogens in the soy. But what people don't realize is how many other foods they're eating that aren't attacked that have just as much or more phytoestrogens than soya has like flaxseed, for example, has very high amounts of phytoestrogens. And nobody's talking about not eating flax because it's dangerous for you. So you have to, you know, look through the actual information, not just hear a number and say, oh, look, there's a lot of phytoestrogens here. That must mean this. But look at all the rest of that and how those play into that. That's, that's absolutely right. I'd like people to, if they can, take some time to study this topic, phytoestrogens, because we're dealing with, uh, as a society, really out of whack hormonal balances. And uh, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, it, that phytoestrogens will, in the long run, uh, help balance those things out. So uh, whether they're menopausal or, or uh, women who are post-pregnancy or uh, men who are dealing with... Um, unwanted uh, holding of fat in some locations, whether it's chest or belly, uh, these things can be related to the bad estrogens that we've discussed. And I think each individual can benefit themselves a lot understanding why phytoestrogen is different and why it's beneficial as, as, as Barbara and Mackenzie have, have discussed. 
Barbara, can you uh, let let the people know where you talk about this in one of your lectures, and they can hear a little bit more in depth? Yes, absolutely. Um, the 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 presentation that I give is is really ba how to balance your hormones. And if you go to YouTube and you 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 put in Barbara O'Neill balancing hormones, you'll get a fifty minute presentation on it. We're also filming at the moment where we've we've just finished one, which will also be up soon. So it is not hard to get that information. Now I wanted to transition us into uh, a discussion about um, chronic fatigue syndrome and its relation to a lot of the things that we've discussed today. Now chronic fatigue is a is a a bit of a buzzword that I don't think I heard much over the last decade until about the last five or six years at that point really exploding as the, as those in society who were feeling these symptoms start to come out more and more and say, that's what it is. That's what I've been experiencing. Can you tell us a little bit about what you've learned about chronic fatigue and maybe what it really is and what the sources of that really might be? Yeah, sure. Sure. I'll try and be quick. <laughs> But you're, ab you're absolutely right, Matt. It's um, something you really didn't hear about uh, 20 years ago. Um, I, I like to know why. Newton's third law of motion states that to every action, there's an equal and an opposite reaction. You, you can't just get chronic fatigue and it is an effect. It is not a cause. So what would be the cause of chronic fatigue syndrome? There is actually only one cause and that is lack of oxygen at the cellular level. But there could be a hundred reasons why there's lack of oxygen at the cellular level. So why do I say that? Well, when you understand the science behind it, in my lectures I explain it. We go to the CBD, the central business district of the human body is the inside working of the cell. So when you go into the little energy cycle in the cell, there are a couple of different energy cycles. One's called the powerhouse, and that's the mitochondria, and inside of that's the little Krebs cycle. Now that little mitochondria, it's only an eight-step pathway, but it delivers 36 units of energy. Whereas another pathway, which is the glycolytic pathway, 20 steps, it only gives two units of energy. So a lot of people with chronic fatigue syndrome they're running up in that 20-step pathway only giving two units instead of 36 units of energy. We have a 100 trillion cells in the body. So, you know, you multiply it by 100 trillion times and if every cell has enough oxygen to deliver 36 units of energy, that person's going to be jumping out of their skin. So I like to go back to, ex to the why to explain that. And that's why I say, and every doctor I've talked to about this, especially specialists in chronic fatigue, say you're absolutely right. What that person needs is oxygen. So then you would inquire, what, why aren't they getting the oxygen? Is it because, well, there can be a whole lot of things. There can be a whole lot of reasons. Is it because the air in their bedroom is stale? Is it because their pillow's mouldy? Is it because they haven't vacuumed under their bed for a long, long time? Is it because their mattress is getting moldy and damp? So when they're breathing in that, that bad air, they're going to wake up feeling like, what do we say in Australia? Something the cat dragged in. So they get up feeling, oh no. And so what do they do to give energy? They take a cup of coffee. Now what the cup of coffee or the cup of tea does, it, it stimulates a crisis response in the body, which gives a little bit of an energy. But because it's a artificial energy, within half an hour, an hour, they're down again. The other stimulant is sugar. Put a bit of sugar in the coffee, then they'll, then they'll get a little bit of a lift. But unfortunately, these stimulants, they're, they're using energy they don't even have. So they, they're contributing to more lack of energy. And lack of sleep is contributing to it. Dehydration is contributing to it. Another big contributing factor is wheat. You see, the wheat was hybridized in the 1950s, and when it was hybridized, it created a very complex, star, uh, very complex gluten or protein structure. It 
created a different starch structure. And one of the most common symptoms of someone having an intolerance to the wheat is brain fog, <laughs> tiredness and bloating. And how many people have that? And so to turn around from chronic fatigue syndrome, all the stimulants have to stop. The bedroom needs to have a spring clean <laughs> and the windows open and the screens washed so that you know, you, you get a white cloth and wipe over your fly screen and usually it's black. In other words, even when your window's open, the air coming in may not be fresh because it's oxygen we need. And start exercising. Right now, Matt and Mackenzie, as we're sitting here, we're breathing in 500 mil of air and breathing out 500 mil of air. But we're running, when we're running up a hill and we get to the top of the hill, Breathing deeply, we're breathing in 3,600 mil of air and we're breathing out 3,600 mil of waste. So exercise. And if you say to someone with chronic fatigue syndrome, do you exercise? The answer is you don't understand. I've got no energy. Well, guess how you get it? <laughs> now, I don't expect someone with chronic fatigue syndrome to run up the hill. Just try walking up the hill. <laughs> And if you have to stop three or four times, so be it. Rome wasn't built in a day. But if every day you implement that little bit of exercise, every day you start hydrating your body, every day you start drinking more water, all of these things can contribute together. Another factor is people are sleeping with a lot of technology around them in their bedroom. They will not wake up revived if there's all those... Uh, different frequencies in their room. See, we, we are electrical people and our body runs according to certain frequencies and it's a totally different frequency to what these gadgets and machines run out. So that's why I keep coming back to the bedroom. We spend a third of our life in there. So that, that room should be a room so that when we get up in the morning, the, the surgeons have done their job. We wake up in a revived, restored, vitalized body ready for the day. But unfortunately, the surgeons are inhibited because the person went to bed too late. There's no fresh air in the bedroom. There's too much technology in the bedroom. And oh no, look what's at the end of their bed. Two dogs. There's no fresh air in that bedroom. <laughs> so that's why I say we've got to go back to the bedroom. We've got to We've got to cleanse it. We've got to put our bedroom through a cleanse. Get those quilts on the line. Start washing them. Yes, build a clothesline. Get them out in the sunshine. So can you see, Matt, that there can be a lot of contributing factors to chronic fatigue syndrome, but the basic cause is lack of oxygen at the cellular level. Absolutely fascinating, and I think really relevant for those who are struggling with this. Um, but I think oxygen is one part of, I believe, eight parts of healthy laws that we can follow and implement in our lives. Some of us know these eight health laws, but um, as we kind of wrap here today, let's go through these eight laws so people can have some tangible steps to take from today's conversation and start implementing some of these things. Again, as you said, Rome wasn't built in a day, so let's go piece by piece and not look to at the end, but just to take the next step. Get outside and get some sunshine. Get outside and get some oxygen. And, and let's talk a little bit about these eight laws and, and discuss how people can, can start living better lives by using these simple steps. That's right. I, I love these laws. Florence Nightingale called them the laws of nursing. Dr. Jackson from New York in the mid-1800s called them laws of life. They're often called the laws of health, the eight principles, the eight doctors. And the first doctor is pure air. So we should be having pure air because those cells need that oxygen. So again, make sure the air that you're breathing is, of the, is top quality. It's been a little cold here in Chattanooga, Tennessee, but I still have my windows open every night. I make sure that I'm warm in my bed but I'm breathing fresh air. Many people wake up tired because they're not breathing in the fresh air while they sleep. The most powerful way to oxygenate the body is exercise. So this is another law. 
exercise. Take time every day to exercise. Even just walking around the block, that can be a good start. And when you get stronger, as your heart gets stronger, your muscles get stronger, your lungs start to take in more oxygen, you can go further for, for less time. Sunshine. Sunshine's not the enemy in the sky, it's the doctor in the sky. We need to visit that doctor every day. There was no sunshine here yesterday, but even being outside, you are getting a little bit of sunshine through those clouds. Yes, you can overdo this doctor. And if you've got milky skin, I heard my skin called that recently. If you've got white skin, you, you need to be careful. So if I'm going out in the sun, I, uh, I'll just be out there with no covering for maybe 15 minutes and then I've got to put the cat on and the long sleeve shirt. But the darker the skin, the more sunshine you need. The very dark skin people need about 10 times the sun that I need. That sunshine is vital for us to be able to get our vitamin D. And our vitamin D is essential for the assimilation calcium, your strong bones. In fact, I was watching a presentation by one doctor who was a, who was a um, he specialized in pathology. He said, he found that every patient he had with COVID had a vitamin D deficiency. We need to be getting outside and getting that sunshine. So make sure you visit that sunshine every day. The next law is temperance. Temperance means not taking anything into the body that will harm it and taking in moderation the good things. All good things should be done in moderation, but there are some things that should never go in. Refined sugar, caffeine, alcohol, tobacco, drugs, chemicals, uh, herbicides, insecticides, mold, and be very cautious of that electromagnetic field, your exposure to it. The next law is rest. Dr. Matthew Walker in his best-selling book, Why We Sleep, he says, eight hours, not negotiable. And the early hours are very important. So you've got a choice there. I thank God for the choices. You can go 8 p.m. to 4 a.m. You can go 9 to 5. That's probably my favorite. Or you, at a stretch, you could go 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. Not negotiable. Those little surgeons that I explained before that have quite a job to do in your body and in your brain while you sleep, let them have time to re to do the recovery, the regeneration and the restoration that is so vital for the proper functioning of our brain and our body in those hours. The next one is proper diet. The Garden of Eden diet tells us that we should be having a high fiber diet, we should be having our proteins every day, your legumes, nuts and seeds, some whole grains, but also we should be having the nuts and seeds for our fats, maybe a little coconut oil, olive oil. We'll talk about those oils a bit more in another, in another presentation. If you want to know about them right now, you can go and watch my lecture called Fantastic Fats on YouTube. We also need fibre, so our fibre comes in, our fruits and our vegetables. The next law is water. Our body is needs hydration. We lose about two and a half quarts a day and that two and a half quarts must be replaced. Two quarts can come in the form of pure water, the other half can come in, in as we eat our fruits, our vegetables, maybe herb teas, maybe vegetable juice. So proper dye is important because the body cannot function, it cannot repair and it cannot heal if it doesn't have nourishment. Nourishment is important. But water is also important because our digestive enzymes are made from water. So it's not only important to eat nourishing food, it's also important to drink water, but not with our meals. We should be drinking water between our meals. We should be stopping the water half an hour before the meal and resume the water about an hour and a half after the meal. That will allow our digestive juices to, to remain nice and acidic because it's only in a very acidic environment in our stomach that our proteins can be broken down. And if you have a glass of water half an hour before the meal, the first thing it will do is thicken that mucosa wall that lines the stomach to protect the stomach against the acid environment.
the eighth law, the final law, but the best law is trust in divine power. Trust that God has given you a body with an inbuilt ability to heal itself. He knows what he's doing. He gave us the water. He gave us the herbs. He gave us a brain that he's able to work these things out. And what, what Jesus said to his disciples, I think, is very applicable. He said, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It's expedient for you that I go away because if I go not away, the comforter will come. But he said, if I depart, I will send him unto you. And then he says, how be it when the, when the spirit of truth is come, he will lead you into all truth. So when we surrender our, our minds and our hearts to God, asking for his guidance, he will send the spirit of truth. And that spirit of truth helps us to discern right from wrong, helps us to discern through, e through reason, intellect and judgment what is the best way that we should go. I love this because it is, we have such a personal God that wants to know each one of us personally. We don't have to find him through rosary beads. We don't have to find him through wooden crosses. We don't have to find him in a church. We can just go to him. We can pray to him and say, Father, I want to know you. And what he says is, read the Bible. When you read Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, you read the stories of Jesus and you begin to understand and know the great God of heaven that made us, made us with an inbuilt ability to heal itself. But not only that, he will give us the wisdom and guidance to know how to live the best life. Well, that's all the time we do have for today, which is unfortunate because I would just love to carry on with this conversation with both of you. But we will get a chance to do this again. We're going to do another episode, but we're going to shift gears a little bit. And we're going to do this to cover the health message from a different angle. And that is what's happening to uh, health information today and, and really what's happened to Barbara. Uh, as many know, she's she's come across some opposition in Australia. And so we want to discuss these things with her and, and set some of the record straight on what's going on with her personally and the health message overall, um, trying to discern what is good and what is not. So make sure to come back next time and join us as we look at a different angle. Mackenzie, thank you so much for joining us. And of course, Barbara, what a pleasure. We look forward to seeing you again. Thank you guys. And, and God bless you each. Thank you very much, Barbara. Thank you.